Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. Last week, as we finished up in chapter 17, Jesus revealed to his disciples once again, as he will continue to do throughout the rest of this uh, book that we're studying, that he was going to be going to Jerusalem, that he was on a mission, and that that mission was to die, to be executed, to be put on trial, an illegal trial, by the way, um, viciously executed, and shed his blood, and then three days later, rise from the dead. I did tell you last week that it's important for us to remember, and I still want to reiterate this to you, that everything that Jesus is teaching these people is being filtered through the natural mind. It's not being perceived through the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. They're trying to understand these things through natural means, because that's all they've got. They've got a great teacher, but as yet, the Holy Spirit has not entered into them. That will happen, and when that happens, their eyes are going to be open, and they're going to understand, and I would imagine they're probably going to be thinking to themselves, man, did I ever have it wrong, you know? Have you ever felt that way when someone's talking to you about Scripture or something, and maybe it was before you had a relationship with God, and you just can't seem to process this Jesus stuff that people are talking about? Sure, he's a good guy. He was a great guy, and he did great things, but this other stuff, I, I have a hard time processing it unless the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us in order to teach us to understand. Paul said this. He said, the things of God and the Spirit are foolishness to the natural man. That is so true, isn't it? You experience that perhaps when you're out there in the world. And you're trying to talk to somebody who's never had an encounter with Jesus. Who's never really understood through the Holy Spirit how to assimilate, if you will, what God is trying to relate to them. I know in here this morning that God's Spirit is here in a very powerful way. I hope that you, and you know what, I, I, I want to say, I hope you sense that. But even if you don't, He's here anyway, right? Because we're not walking around by how we feel you know, you might come in and say, well, I didn't feel anything. Well, you came in faith and obedience and you got blessed. And you don't walk out of here without being blessed. Does anybody walk out of here without being blessed? I don't know of anybody. Sometimes it's hard to get here. <laughs> you know, I, I'm one of these guys. I was born in Indianapolis, so uh, today's kind of a big day. They have the race going today. And, uh, hey, it would have been really kind of easy to just kick back in the PJs and watch the race and, you know, you may have had things that you may have wanted to do today and what I'm saying is that sometimes it's a little bit difficult for us to find our way here. But when we do, when we're obedient, when we're here, I know that none of us regret being here. We all leave encouraged, we all leave glad that we came. And that really speaks volumes as to what God is doing in this room and in your hearts this morning. It's very important. Now, as we move forward in this chapter 18, we're only going to look at six verses this morning. But these six verses are very, very important, but yet very elementary and very simple. Sometimes it's the simple things that we have a hard time grasping. Sometimes it's those, those 
Simple things that are difficult to say, well, I'm too grown up for that simple stuff. I already know all that stuff, right? Well, let's take a look at what Jesus is talking about here this morning. In verse 1 of chapter 18, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who, then, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him and sat him in the midst of them. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you're converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives One little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was drowned in the depth of the sea. So that doesn't sound very complicated, does it? I mean, you know, it's pretty... uh, straightforward but what is going on this is totally contrary to everything that's been embedded in my brain all my life who is the greatest who doesn't want to be the greatest huh i mean who wants to be a loser left right hand i don't know I don't think anybody really does, you know. We are brought up in a culture. The winner gets the trophy. You don't get the trophy when you come in last. Well, let me rephrase that. You shouldn't get a trophy when you come in last, but it seems we're living in a world right day where everybody gets a trophy, right? Which is kind of silly in and of itself. But the point is not so much whether you are first or last. It's a matter of our heart. It's a matter of our motivation in life. What motivates you? You want to be the best dressed? You want to be the top of the rung? You know, these disciples, as they're walking on the trail, actually, they're going to Capernaum. Uh, probably take a little rest there. And so they came, and, and they're having this little argument. Now, Jesus is probably in the front of the guys. They're probably in the back. The ones that are bickering are probably bickering like this with each other, and they're probably trying to keep this conversation Uh, pretty much to themselves, not wanting to maybe draw Jesus' attention to what they're saying. This was an issue that they were continually fighting over. All of them were striving to get that name first. And of course, every time you read a list of them, it's always Peter's name first. And James and John, those three. And so I can imagine that maybe the other guys back in the background whose names aren't first, they were probably trying to figure out how they could get their name first. This was an issue. They argued about it. And it's obvious by what they're arguing about, they don't have a clue concerning the character of the kingdom of heaven. So what did Jesus mean? Well, when he spoke of the kingdom of heaven, they were thinking about the kingdom which they supposed that he was about to set up as a Messiah. They were asking the question because they were supposing, just like every other person would have, with common expectation, that he was about to set up some kingdom of great splendor. And they wanted to know who was going to have the principal offices, the important posts, 
honor, and profit. Mark, in Mark 9, um, <clears throat> excuse me, by the way, um, all th- Mark, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, they all three tell this story. Now, when you find the same story in all three Gospels, you need to sit back and say to yourself, this must be pretty important if the Holy Spirit wants us to read it three times, <laughs> right? While it might be simple, it is very important. In the Gospel of Mark in chapter 9, it says that they came to Capernaum, and when they were in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. And sitting down, Jesus called the twelve, and he said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. I think right away that would change my ambitions, huh? Right away, I have to be last to be first. This doesn't make sense. I have to be a servant of all. And Jesus, when he asked one what they're arguing about, they were silent. They didn't want to tell him because they knew that he probably wasn't going to respond very positively to their childish little uh, bantering, if you will, that they were that they were having. You know, it's really sad when you think about it how much pride gets in the way of our lives. And even, even when you become born again and even if you fall in love with Jesus, we drag some of this junk right into our Christian lives too. We drag this stuff into our relationship with the Lord and into our relationship with each other And we set ourselves up for disappointment because we really don't have a clear picture of what God has in store for us. Jesus knew what they were arguing about all the time, the whole time. Whether he overheard it or whether it was just because this is Jesus. (laughs) He hears everything. He can read your thoughts. He's God. Not hard for him to figure out what they were arguing over, the greatest in the kingdom. Now, maybe, again, we have to look back at ourselves here, perhaps not to be too hard on these disciples for their arguments, because their problem that they're having here is a problem that's common to all humanity. All humanity. It doesn't matter where you come from. One of the common problems we have is we want power. We want prestige. Status and control, really important. Questions of life. Who's on top? Who's the most important? Who has the most symbols of greatness? And then the best question of all, who is the greatest? In verse 2, it says that he called a little child and had him stand among them. And he he told him, I'm telling you the truth, unless you become like this little child, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Now, hold on one minute here. I've been told that i got to go through all these requirements. i got to do all this religious stuff. I need to be a good boy and a good girl, a grown-up, and keep all the rules. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you're converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, the Bible tells us it's by grace that we're saved. Through faith, not by works. So we might look at this and we might say, well, where's the grace and the, and the faith and the mercy in this statement right here? Well, we'll see that as we go down through here. This doesn't negate those elements of salvation. 
it reinforces those elements of salvation, actually. Because in verse 4, he tells us, whoever humbles himself as this little child would be the greatest in the kingdom. So what's important for me and you to understand this morning about what Jesus says 2,000 years ago that contradicts everything that our culture is about? Greatness. You know, if you were to go to a, a seminar, uh, self-help or self-growth kind of a, a seminar and pay hundreds of dollars to go in and listen to somebody that has a doctor in front of his name or they're a celebrity or maybe they're a really, really rich multi-millionaire business world or a politician or even an athlete. They do these great motivational seminars. Is that what we're looking for here? Well, Jesus said we should be drawing our attention to the character, and that's a big word, to the character of a child. What is it about a child that Jesus is referring to? Back in Mark again, um, it tells us that when they got into the house that Jesus sat down. That means this is a teaching moment. That's what's going on here. And he breaks the news to them. If you want to be first, you're going to have to be last. In Luke 22, 24, this dispute arose among them as to who had been considered to be the greatest. And Jesus said, you know, the kings of the Gentiles lord over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. In other words, I'm going to benefit from you. I'm the ruler, you're the servant, and your purpose is to benefit me. I'm therefore a benefactor, if you will. But you, he said, you're not like to be like that. The greatest among you should be the young, like the youngest. And the one who rules should be like the one who serves. These statements that we're reading in each of the three Gospels are very similar, but each one of them adds a little bit of information that the other one doesn't have. And actually, one of them tells us that when Jesus took this child, that he had the child on his lap. So we're not talking a 13-year-old kid. We're not talking a 10-year-old kid. We're talking maybe a toddler, a little child because if we were talking about a 10 year old or a 12 year old you know by that age kids are already messed up right by that age kids are already forming their feelings about who they are and what it means to be great and I don't know maybe your kids were different but mine really wanted to be first both of them you know, I have one son over here, and he has 15 trucks, and he's in the dirt. I got another son over here that's got one. This guy comes over to this guy and says, I want your truck. He said, no, I'm not giving you my truck. You got all those. I don't care. So what does he do? He grabs the truck, pushes his brother down in the dirt, and walks over here with his truck and steals it from him. Now, if you were an adult, you'd be arrested for that. Okay, that's theft, assault and battery, maybe attempted murder. Who knows? I've seen some pretty vicious kids. So at what point is it that as children, that innocence that we once had disappears? And that begins to happen when we've been in this corrupt world long enough for the junk of it to start seeping in to who we are. So that's not who the Lord's talking about here. He's talking about a child before that happens. And we'll see that as we go down through. It's interesting that the disciples were asking about status. Everybody wants to know about status. But Jesus answered, uh, 
he suggested that their position in the kingdom was, it was important. Uh, but whether they would be qualified to enter, well, you got to change. Something has to take place in you as an adult. You have to change. The word we have in our text is converted. And that's exactly what it means. It means to be changed from a way of life, a way of thinking, uh, what our priorities are in our lives. Every one of you know that when you were converted, that you were changed. We all know that our interests changed, the way we think changed. What was important to us changed. There's a beautiful song that we used to sing years ago, and part of it says that the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. And isn't that exactly what happens? Those things that were glittery, the shiny object, if you will, they don't glitter so much because we've had this relationship with the Lord. We're able to see beyond that. We have been converted. A person must change. And, you know, it's a verb. It's not a noun. That means it's a word of action. It's something that we have to do. Now, it's something that we should willingly want to do. It's interesting to me that kids were always attracted to Jesus. And here, you know, here you got the Pharisees and the scribes and our little group of apostles or disciples here. None of them has a clue. And here comes Jesus in the midst of them giving this extremely important mindset to them. I'm sure it was shocking to them. To be qualified for the kingdom of heaven, I must become a little child. Little children didn't have very many rights back then. And you know what? If you weren't the firstborn, you didn't have much at all. It was always the firstborn that got the good stuff. If you were in a family that had several kids, or maybe you were a parent, you know what the word hand-me-down means, right? I was born first, so I got all the new stuff. <laughs> and I made sure to wear it out before I handed it down to. But our character needs to change. There's two things I want to mention here. Um, their opinions, their feelings about Jesus need to change. Because their expectation was that he was going to be some kind of a prince. All they had for an example was the kings and the monarchs in their time, if you will. And when Jesus talked about ruling and being a king, their minds go right to Caesar or Herod or some worldly ruler or monarch which is totally out of what Jesus was trying to tell them. And they figured that he was going to have a cabinet. And who's going to be the big guy in the cabinet? And where are you going to, what part of it are you going to serve in? And this great government that we're going to... They had the wrong view. They had the wrong expectations because none of that was going to take place. How disappointed would they be? if he did not rise from the dead. How disappointed would they have been if the last time they saw him, he was on that, right there, suffering, bleeding, in agony. They would have walked away thinking, this was all just a false hope. This is not going to change anything. So it's important here that they come to understand the notion that they need to be changed. They cannot look at God's kingdom the way the world looks at the kingdom. People have a lot of different ideas about who Jesus is. You probably know that if you've ever tried to witness to somebody. You go and you talk, you know what, it's all cool, the Jesus thing. Yeah, he was a really cool dude, but, and if, if it's good for you, that's, that's good, but you know, I, I just don't need the Jesus thing, thanks. 
I've had people come to me and I try to share with them and even invite them to church. And I've had them respond to me and say, you know, that's good for you. I'm glad you were able to get off the addictions and you were able to turn your life around and you're able to have purpose in your life. That's good for you. But you know, I went to church one time. And when I was a kid, I had it shoved down my throat. And I don't want it anymore. As a matter of fact, the church I went to, they kicked me out. They rejected me. They judged me. They're a bunch of hypocrites. And you know what? I got enough problems in my life right now without going into that environment and adding all problems to it. That's the view. Aren't you glad that we're different? Huh? I mean, I want to believe that with my whole heart. That over the years we've learned. We don't judge people. We don't reject people. We don't have a criteria to come in and worship and learn with us. Oh, of course, you know, if somebody's obnoxious and disruptive and whatever, of course you have to deal with that. But I don't care what you wear, as long as you got clothes on or a kilt. (laughs) I told him, there better be something under that kilt. (laughs) You see? Ten shades of red, just like that. You can don that thing anytime you want, my brother. I think it's great. But what's the expectation when you come to church? Well, you want to walk into a place where you feel warmth, where you feel love, where you feel acceptance. You're not going to be judged. And guess what? I think that we could go all the way around the room and every single person in here could say, well, I'm still struggling with fill in the blank. We're all struggling with something, aren't we? None of us has arrived. So who are we to sit there and go, well, I'm better than you are, and you better go straighten out your act before you get through the doors. I don't believe Jesus is, I don't believe that Jesus is like that. You know, our motto at this church, and it always has been, is sharing the love of Jesus. That's what we want to do. We want to share the love of Christ with people who haven't experienced it. And I know that once you experience it, it can become life-changing. And I also know that each and every one of us in here are vessels unto ourselves that we can share that love. It doesn't just have to come from the pastor or the greeter at the door. It comes from all of us. We take that religious mindset, we throw it out, and we want relationship, not religion. That's the most important thing. So Jesus said something very profound. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. To be converted backwards, if you will. Children at that age that I described... Um, for the most part, they really don't have this huge ambition problem going on. They don't have a pride problem. They're not haughty. Characteristically, children are quite humble and teachable at that age. That's why it's so important that we instill in our young ones the things of God while they're young, before all this junk starts creeping into their minds. And in these respects, Jesus is saying, I want you to become like that. Some of them might have thought, you know, that's really insulting. I've worked really hard to try to be a holy guy, and now you're telling me i got to be like a little child? You're telling me that I need to lay aside my ambitious views and my pride? Do I need to be willing to occupy the proper station in which God has put me in? See, that's part of the problem with pride. We tend to want to rise up above the station of life that God has asked us to live in. And for every single one of us, that station is lowly. It's humble. It's others-centered. There's an acronym that I've always loved, JOY. Some of you know. Jesus, 
others yourself. You want real joy? That's how you get it. And notice where you fall in that equation. Last. And you might be thinking, well, if I'm always last, then who's going to look out for me? The guy next to you. Because he's putting you first or second. He's putting you in a priority higher than he puts himself. And that's exactly what Scripture says we should do. That we should esteem the others better than ourselves. Now, there's another glitch. How in the world do I do that? Esteem others to be better than myself? Man, I am looking out for numero uno. Huh? It's sad. It's sad that that's what the sinful nature does in our lives. And these disciples were power hungry. And they were ambitious. And, you know, one of the things about being power hungry and ambitious, it leaves victims behind. It hurts people. This humility of children, this characteristic of this child it's truly honest. It's transparent. There's no pretense there. They are who they are. And they don't know how to be anybody else. They don't know how to cover up. They don't know how to act like something that they're not. It seems that our culture is always motivated for being first. Again, as I mentioned, the sports awards is given the first place, not last place. In business, it's not the bathroom cleaner that gets the recognition, it's the president of the corporation. This is even apparent in the church world. Churches, have you noticed, they want to be called first. First Baptist, first Christian, first this one and that. Where's the second? Have you ever heard of a second Baptist church? I mean, that in itself is almost like, what is going on here? That means if I don't go to the first one and I find another one to go to, I got a problem here? No. I think it's just that struggle to be on top even in the church. Someone might say, oh yeah, well I have an office building and I, I take care of, you know, 40 employees. Oh, well that's nothing. I have a corporation where I oversee 9,000 of them. Whew. You would never think that that would creep into the church, do you? Well, I'm the pastor of a church with 5,000 members. <laughs> You know what, I'll tell you a true story. When we first started, and you know, there's only been a couple of times in all these years that literally we've seen this room bulging at the seams. I'd love to see it every Sunday, but I'm not in charge of that. God's in charge of that, right? He told me that early on. You just be faithful and I'll deal with the numbers, you know. Okay, that's what I'll do. And so I go to these pastor's conferences or I go to these things where there's other ministers and they're there and there's maybe, oh, I've been doing where there's 900 other pastors. And it's a great time of refreshment. But how many times do they come up and say, oh, hi, my name's Bob. Hi, Bob, my name's Tom. Hey, Tom, where you at? Oh, I'm out in Sheridan, Oregon. Oh, and here's the first question. How many people you got in your church? <laughs> and, you know, there was times when I said, oh, about 20 and then next year, I would go back, and I could say, 25? <laughs> oh, well, we got about 900. Okay, maybe I should keep a distance from you, or maybe I should get closer to you, or something. And you know what Lord told me? It doesn't matter. So I, I kind of did something that was sneaky. They say, how many folks you got in your church? I say, oh, about 9,000. How many you got? Oh, we only got 600. Ah! You know, I mean, why are you asking me that question? But 
it creeps, my point being, this mentality of being the greatest even creeps into our own midst in the bride, in the church, and it should not be so. We should be servants to one another. You need to ask that question of yourself this morning. Am I really being a servant to my brothers and sisters, to my church? Am I doing anything more than occupying a space for an hour and a half on Sunday? Something to pray about, perhaps. Jesus said that the way the kings of the Gentiles do it is they lord over them. Now, I've got to stop right there for just a moment because this is probably one of the most misunderstood things about marriages. And it's not always the man. But I've heard it over and over again. I'm the man of this house, and you will submit to my rules. Now get in there and wash them dishes. While I go fishing. While I play cards with the boys. You know, it's not just the husbands. I mean, the wives can be that way sometimes too, ladies. You know that. There's always that, you know, that, that thing where people say, so who wears the pants in your family? I always tell them, well, I do. It's just my wife tells me which ones to put on. <laughs> right? But when you have a person in a marriage that dominates like that, that is called ungodly marriage. Sorry. It's not my stuff and your stuff. It's our stuff. It's not your money, my money, this. No, that's not a marriage. A marriage is when we come together as one. We share all things together, right? Any other way, it always brings strife. It always brings jealousy. It always brings about an unhealthy marriage. That whole principle extends clear out into our whole lives as we deal with one another, as we deal with God. And it's so important to learn this vital lesson, this little child on the lap of Christ. The obvious answer to the question is that the ones who are at the table, as we mentioned earlier, who's the boss, Jesus said? Who's greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? Well, the obvious answer is the one who's at the table. But Jesus turns around and says, but I've come to you as a servant. I'm allowing you to sit at the table. I'm, I'm ministering to your needs. As a matter of fact, very soon, in just a little bit of time, I'm going to demonstrate that by putting a, a servant's robe on myself and washing all of your filthy, dirty feet. Just to demonstrate what a servant really looks like. Now, if Jesus could do that, what would make me think, or you, us, for one minute, I'm too good for that. You want me to go vacuum the church? <laughs> I'm too good for that. I should be in advising the pastor every Thursday afternoon where I should be. Or I should be in the front doing my... No, no, no. The servant is the greatest of all. I get to stand up here and talk to you every week. Doesn't mean I'm your boss. Doesn't mean I'm higher than you. I want you to know something really from my heart. We are all in a boat. And we all have an oar. And we're all rowing together. I have an oar just like you. And we're all trying to reach our destination. I don't want to be the captain of your ship. I don't have pixie dust that can fix your world. I'm just a servant who loves to teach God's word. Who's the captain of our ship? Jesus. 
You ever see those old movies where they're rowing the guys up front on the drum? Boom, boom. It's Jesus that's keeping the rhythm for us. He's keeping the pace for us. Now, Paul describes these things very, very clear as he talks about the body of Christ. Who wants to be a big toe in the body of Christ? Have you ever seen people's big toes? Man, I've seen some gnarly looking big toes. Wouldn't want to touch them. You got to go get a metal grinder to trim them. <laughs> or wire clippers or something, right? But did you know that maybe one or two of you in here is the big toe? And I want you to think about it. I knew a guy. <laughs> I knew a guy that got stepped on by a pig and it crushed both of his big toes. Had to have him amputated. And whenever he would stand there talking to you, he'd be doing this. Because if you don't know it, your big toe is what keeps your balance. It keeps your balance. Do we need big toes in the body of Christ? Absolutely. It might not be the most glorious position, but how necessary is it? How important is it? It's a true position of servanthood, if you will. Jesus is trying to tell us here this morning that our acceptance of people is not to be based on their position, their status, their supposed importance, or how they might advance my own personal goals and aspirations. We should be able to love on one another just for who we are. And we should be able to enjoy the gifts that God has given each one of us together. We should be able to have harmony. Now, as we get to the bottom of this, it says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hanging around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woo! A millstone. That's a, a grinding stone that they would put grain in and the, and the beast would go around and around and grind it with the millstone. And, and is he talking just about little ones, like the little ones sitting on his lap right there? Well, yeah. And when you look at our culture today and you see the outright war against our little ones, there's going to be a lot of millstones handed out. But let me tell you guys something, okay? He's going to take care of that. Fret not. He sees it. He will fulfill his promise in that area. But he's also talking about us. He's also talking about those little baby Christians that come in. Then go into these places where they're judged or they're, they're, not, they're not loved on and, and they leave with bitterness in their hearts. He's talking about those people too. Because while you might look like an adult, we are still, in a way, children inside. We're children of God. That's why it doesn't say, we're men of God. We're children of God. With a humble heart. Terrible judgment, having a large millstone put around your neck. So yes, these are very simple principles for us to look at this morning, but they are so important. They're part of the lifeblood of who we are. Why don't we have you guys come on up? By the way, it's nice to have you back, Patrick. So let me just say, before we close together, if you need prayer this morning, we would like to make Lonnie and Chris available to you right over here in the prayer room. Beautiful, nice, quiet place. Maybe you really think that you're important. Maybe you need to get a little bit of humbling going on. You know, James says you have not because you ask not. 
Oh, and let me just ask a favor of you before I pray to end this. We're going to be giving away food again. Every Sunday we do this. There are people going down there right now to prepare these tables for you. Please do me a favor. Please wait until they're ready for you. Okay? Because they're working hard. They're servants. They're literally serving at the table. But hang out until they say, okay, you guys can come in. Okay? Dude, that's, a, that's just a, a little favor that I would ask of you this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Lord, for the principles and the simplicity of your word. Lord, it, sometimes when we read these things, it just attacks everything that we've been holding on to all of our lives. It strips away those things of the world. Lord, make us more like children. Make us honest. Make us transparent. Without blind ambition and pretense, Lord, make us your servants with a heart for others. Take away that get-to-the-top mentality. Lord, give us a heart to lift up others rather than defending our own place. Help us to understand, Lord, who you are and continue by your Holy Spirit to mold us into your image. God, for your sake, give us humble hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.